But we're going to pray this morning, and then we'll jump in to Nehemiah. If you bow your heads with me. Lord, uh, we just thank you for each and every mom in the room. Lord, we're so thankful for, uh, for how that they've loved us and cared for us uh, as children. Lord, and um, Lord, I'm just... I'm just reminded of the words in Scripture. You say you knit us together in, in our mother's womb, Lord, uh, and how they are inherently part of who we are and how we came to be, Lord. And I'm just so thankful for my mom this morning, and I know each and every uh, person in this room is thankful for their mom. Um, but, Lord, we also know that uh, Mother's Day can carry with it some hurt, Lord, some some uh, some thoughts of loss and hurt and heartache, Lord, and I pray that you just be with each and every person as they uh, celebrate or go through Mother's Day in their own way, Lord, and we just, uh, we turn to you and we, uh, we look to you, uh, Lord, and we pray that as we dive into your word that you'd give us understanding and clarity and you would continue to grow us and shape us every single day. In your precious name, Jesus' name, amen. Also, moms, uh, as you leave today, uh, there's a table out there with cupcakes for you, so we would love if you grabbed one of those and indulged. Uh, I can't officially say that they're calorie-free, but all you need to know is that they're calorie-free, all right? For, for, you get one free one, all right? Come on. Um, but we're jumping into the book of Nehemiah this morning, uh, so if you would turn with me to, guess what, Nehemiah chapter 1. Um, I love the book of Nehemiah because uh, it tackles some uh, really great concepts for our life. Not only does it give us the history of the nation of Israel, not only does it talk about um, incredible leadership skills and give us an example of how to be leaders both um, in our jobs, in our homes, and in our own lives as we seek to uh, follow God, but it also is an incredible testimony to the providence of God and how he, uh, throughout time, is constantly for his people in control and, uh, and faithful to his word. And so we're going to jump in and we're going to read uh, through uh, chapter 1, going through, uh, kind of snipping, snipping it up, looking at some different pieces. So we're going to jump in right away. Nehemiah chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 2. It says this. That Hanai, one of the brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I, Nehemiah, asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So now you read that, you read that initial piece of, uh, of the book of Nehemiah, and I'd imagine unless you've studied Nehemiah, you're a little bit confused. You're like, um, what's going on? So during this period of time, the nation of Israel or the Jews were not residing in, uh, in Israel. They had been exiled. Why had that happened? Because the nation of Israel like we often do in our own hearts, are very fickled. And they will constantly go back and forth between worshiping God and worshiping false gods and idols. And so they bounce back and forth, bounce back and forth throughout the course of Old Testament history. And every time they turn to false gods and idols, God says, okay, that's fine. You're more than like you're more than uh, you're more than okay to do that. But here's the thing: you're going to incur the consequences of doing that. And if you're going to worship other gods, I'm going to let them protect you instead of me protect you. And what happens? They have no protection, right? Because those false gods mean nothing. And so what happened was when the nation of Israel turned to these false gods. These other foreign nations came in and they invaded Israel. And they tore down their walls, they destroyed the temple, and they took the nation of Israel with them back to their homeland to make them slaves. And so there, the nation of Israel was enslaved. They were away from 
whom they were far. And while they were in exile, and while the temple was destroyed, and while the walls were, um, were torn down, there was a remnant who ended up escaping, who ended up leaving. And this was some 70, 80 years around that amount of time after the exile. So they've been gone in slavery. These are not the original exiles. These are most likely their children or their children's children. They escape, they leave, and they go back. And their job originally was to rebuild the temple devoted to God and to find the books of the Bible or the books of the law, the Pentateuch at that time, and record that and put it back together and reinstitute it for the people who had come back to live there. And that is, if you're familiar with Scripture, that's what the book of Ezra is about. That's Ezra's crew. So Ezra goes back first. He begins to do that. But then here's the thing. In order to stay safe in olden times, you needed a wall to keep things out. Not only does a wall keep out like animals, like bears and lions and things like that, but it also keeps out your enemies. And when Israel comes back, they, they were not short on enemies, both wild and human. And so there was, there was this constant threat of people c- wanting to come in and to stop the process that was happening. And so Nehemiah, he knew that Ezra and his crew had gone back to Jerusalem to begin this rebuilding process. And so naturally he cared, right? This, these are his people. He's still very devoted to the Lord, And he knows that the temple of the Lord is being built. And so he has a vested interest and a deep care for them succeeding, for that being built. And so he asks, he says, hey, what's going on? How how are things going? And so this guy by the name of Hanai, he comes with this message that, hey, things are not looking great. Yeah, work is being done. Yeah, they're there. Nothing's happened yet. But things aren't looking good because the wall isn't being rebuilt. So yeah, they may, they may rebuild the temple. They may put back together the books of the law. But who knows how long that's going to last if they don't have a wall to protect them. If the walls and the gates of the city aren't put back to normal. And so immediately, he responds in verse 4. And he says this, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Immediately, we see Nehemiah is just ripped up. His heart is just broken. He so deeply cares. He has such deep empathy for, the, for Ezra and the people that went with him to go back and rebuild the temple. And he fears for them. It's so interesting. A lot of times, we struggle to care outside of the people who are maybe in our, our immediate relational circles, right? Yeah, we, we see, see things happen to people and we try to empathize. But if you're anything like me, you really struggle to empathize. Or, you know, you may see the, uh, the commercials on TV of the sad dogs with the Sarah McLaughlin song, right? And your heart is broken for a little bit, right? Or you just, you just flip to another channel because you don't want to think about it, Right? But a lot of times, we like to be apathetic about people around us. Nehemiah, he he was not like that at all. He was someone who deeply cared for people around him. 
for people not even around him all the way back in Jerusalem. His heart was so incredibly broken, not only that he prayed for them, but that he sat down and he wept and he mourned for them and he fasted and he sought God's help. Man, that is convicting to me. Because the question that comes to my mind is, how often do you pray for other people? How often do you actively seek to pray for other people? How often do you pray for people you don't know, right? How often do you pray for things that are going on in our world or for uh, people who... Uh, are on our prayer chain? Or are you even on the prayer chain to receive those things? See, this immediate look into Nehemiah, it's a challenge to care. To care for what's going on in your own life. Because Nehemiah, in some sense, had a vested interest what was going on, right? He worshiped the Lord and he wanted a temple to be rebuilt. But also, to pray for people who you don't know. People who are hurting and you know that you can seek and go to the Lord for them. It's convicting. Because, like I said, sometimes we like to turn a blind eye because we got enough problems going on in our own lives that we don't want to have to think about someone else's. But continue on. As he prays, he turns to the Lord, and we get a glimpse into, during that time of fasting and that time of prayer and seeking the Lord, we get a glimpse into some of his prayers. It says this, verse 5, and I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments... Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I my fa- uh, and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. And so here we see this immediate response in this time of mourning, in this time of prayer. And here, I find Nehemiah's response very insightful for a couple reasons. First off, if my people including me and my family, were taken away into slavery, exiled far away, our homes were destroyed, burned down, and then I heard that people escaped and fled and went back to rebuild the temple, and they were in trouble, I would probably be a little bit irritated and frustrated. Like, come on, seriously? Seriously, like, this is what we have to go through? Again, we're in trouble? Again, we're going through hardship? Like, didn't you put us through enough the first time? How are we going to have to keep going through these things, God? Right? Isn't there a little bit? uh, I, I would feel like there would be a sense of anger from Nehemiah. Or a sense of frustration built up, a sense of bitterness against God. But no, he starts off by acknowledging the faithfulness of God and the love of God. It's very interesting. He starts off by acknowledging the faithfulness of God who keeps his covenants and has a steadfast love for his people. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't really be feeling those things. But Nehemiah turns and he appeals to God. And he appeals to those 
those realities of God's character. But then the next thing I find extremely interesting is he then takes responsibility. He says, I pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. I find this very odd because he wasn't really alive during this time, right? Like like I said, it was 70 years past that the, the Israelites were taken into exile. But he still sits and he acknowledges, he recognizes that sin, that disobeying God and turning away from God is what got them here. And he says, here's the thing. Responsibility has to be taken. Forgiveness has to be sought. So I will do it. Now, this is very foreign to us. Our culture wants nothing to do with taking responsibility. In fact, we kind of prize ourselves on being defensive. When people criticize us, one of the first things we do is want to flip it on them, right? The last thing we want is for someone to see the things that we struggle with and the hardship that we're going through. We want to kind of be viewed as the greatest. And that's reflected for me in in games, right? For me, I love games. Board games, video games, any type of game, uh, sports, I'm into it. But the games that I struggle with the most are games that are like one-on-one, right? Where it's just me against someone else. And the reason why I struggle with those the most is because I'm all good if I win, right? If I win, then I'm like, oh, yeah. You know, I did it. I'm the best. I, 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 I'm great. But the reason why I struggle with one-on-one games is because when you lose, it's really hard to cope, right? It's really hard to cope. Because when you're playing a team game or you got other people on your team, you know, you don't want to publicly throw your teammate under the bus. But when you're laying in bed and you're thinking about and you're stewing about losing, Maybe you're not as competitive as I am, but that's me, right? I, I'm laying in bed and I'm stewing about losing. At least I have some comfort in being able to blame my partner or being able to blame a couple teammates, right? You don't want to say it. I'll say it for you, right? There is some semblance of, well, my teammate didn't play that well either, right? But when it's one-on-one, you have no other choice but to simply say, I got beat, right? I, I wasn't as good. I misplayed. I chose wrong. Or the other person was just better than me. Man, even just saying that out loud <laughs> makes, gives me like a little bit of stew, fire, right? Because we don't want to accept that reality. We don't want to accept the reality that we're subpar or that we've done something wrong or that we aren't good enough. But Nehemiah, he finds favor with the Lord because he had an entire nation who he could have blamed it on. An entire race of people who could have been his scapegoat. And you know what he did? He went to the Lord and he accepted responsibility. The reality is we must take accountability for our actions to begin the rebuilding process. We must take accountability for our actions to begin the rebuilding process. Before Nehemiah takes any steps to 
start planning to think about his return to Jerusalem to talk to his boss, which we're going to talk about in, in, coming, uh, in coming weeks. Before he does any of that, he understands that the first thing that must be done is accountability has to be taken. He has to look and say, who got us here? Who got us to where we are? The brokenness that all of the nation of Israel is feeling, how did it happen? We did it. And for us, we know that there are times where our actions, the decisions we've made, the things we've pursued, the focus, the priorities that we've shown have gotten us and led us to brokenness. But we love to blame circumstance. We love to blame other people, maybe who have backstabbed us. And do they have a hand in those things? Yeah. I'm not going to say they're exempt either. But when we stray our own way, at the end of the day, we are responsible. And in order to start that rebuilding process, we must take accountability for our actions. It's interesting. We love to conceal or pretend like those things don't exist. Or we love to resist taking accountability or responsibility for our sin. But David, he, or sorry, Solomon in in Proverbs, he writes about those who want to pretend like they don't have a hand in their sin. And he says this, Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen: whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. And this word prosper here, we think a lot of times that means financially prosper. But the way that he flips the script and says, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. This is the idea of an emotional and a spiritual prospering. A lot of times when we find ourselves emotionally and spiritually just at rock bottom or bankrupt, with nothing left to give or nothing left in our tank, it's because we're trying to conceal things. We're trying to put on a face. We're trying to hide sin. We're trying to hide brokenness, heartache, and make it look all good. But the one who confesses and is open and, fors or, and forsakes that will find mercy. If you want to begin this rebuilding process, you have to take responsibility. And for some of you, that's taking responsibility in your families as well. Sometimes there's brokenness, or a lot of times, if we're honest, there's brokenness in our families. And it's because we like to turn blind eyes to it. Or pretend like, oh, it's not that bad. You know, it... Every family has their, their level of hardship. It's true. But that's not how it was designed. And so some of us look and we see brokenness in our family, and the reality is we have to take responsibility for that. Not only do we have to take responsibility for our actions that cause that brokenness and own up, we have to take responsibility to be part of the rebuilding process and pray for our families and go before the Lord for our families. But I think that earlier part of taking responsibility is so incredibly important. I think as believers and as believing parents, we need to normalize apologizing to our kids when we mess up. 
And man, is it difficult. Because we want to appear the biggest and the best. But Nehemiah, he demonstrated first and foremost that accepting responsibility, seeking forgiveness is what has to happen first. And then he continues. And he demonstrates something very interesting as he changes the tone in his prayer a little bit. He says this, continuing on in verse 8 of Nehemiah 1. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people. But if you return to me and seek my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the utmost parts of the heavens, from there I will gather you and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make, your, to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants whom delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today. And grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And so here we see what Nehemiah does is he immediately turns to remind God of his promises. Now, it's very interesting. I don't, I don't think Nehemiah thinks God has forgotten. But what he's doing is he's appealing to the promises of God and saying, God, these are the things you've promised. We are seeking to do them. And we ask that you follow through. Right? That's what he says. He's, he appeals to God's word. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. Check. We've done that. Right? There's the first part. But now, we're looking for verse 9. But if you, if you return to me and keep your commandments and do them, Though your outcasts are in the utmost parts of the heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Saying is, what he's saying is, God, we are turning to you now. Lord, only by your hand can these things succeed. Only by your hand can we be united. Only through your word and your promises and your doing can we find safety and we be returned to Jerusalem. It's only you. And Lord, please, by your word, show up. He moves to reliance on God's word. And the truth that we see here is we must cling to the promises of God as we are being rebuilt. I talked about it a lot last week, right? The idea of trusting in and clinging to and remembering the promises that God has given us in his word. And there are so many that in times of hurt, in times of hardship, in times where we're struggling, to, struggling we can turn and we can read those things and be encouraged but here is an, also an encouragement. You can pray those things. Say, Lord, you said this in your word. I need this to show up in my life. I bet you won't find any Bible verses about winning the lottery, right? But you will find some about comfort, about peace, about joy, about understanding, about wisdom, about kindness, about Growth, spiritual growth from times of trouble and trials. And ultimately, there are ones that we can really turn to in times of sin. Right? We talked about that idea of concealing sin or starting this rebuilding process. I'm reminded of verses like 1 John 1.9. This is a, a verse that I regularly think about and turn to 
especially in times where I find myself dwelling on my past or who I was and the things that I used to do. It says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, this is the truth of the gospel. This is the truth that Christ, in his death on the cross and his resurrection, what he has paid for us, that if we confess our sins, if we confess with our mouth that he is Lord, and we believe in our heart that he is risen from the dead, that we can have that forgiveness. And then that forgiveness can lead us to everlasting life. And that those times of sin, they do not continue to blemish us, but that he is faithful to forgive us and to continue to cleanse us from that unrighteousness. And so this morning, there are so many promises in Scripture that can be encouraging to you and I. But that one specifically, I think, is so important. And if you haven't received the gospel, if you haven't committed your life to the Lord, this morning I would love to invite you to do so. To confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord and he's risen from the dead. And so that, that promise, that, that, that line in God's word can ring true for you. But this morning, as we close, I want to encourage you to turn to prayer this week. You see that Nehemiah, right, in this very instant of trouble, at the drop of the hat of trouble, he immediately turned to prayer. We've been talking about prayer a lot. But I want to encourage you to make turning to prayer your default this week. Man, when you have bad news, take a second and pray. Even that means, hey, give me, give me 10 seconds and just take a second and pray. You're struggling with something as you're driving, start to pray. Keep your eyes open, <laughs> but start to pray. Man, your kids are frustrating you for a second. Pray, maybe pray with them. Man, what would it look like if our default became turning to prayer so that we could rely on the Lord in times of temptation, fear, worry, anger, exhaustion, discouragement, or anything else? Turn to prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, we turn to you. Lord, we turn to you this morning. We know that you are a God who deeply cares, whose steadfast love is there throughout the ages. Lord, in this morning, we seek you. Lord, and I pray that each and every one of us would turn to you, turn to your word for promises and encouragement. Lord, and that we would seek you. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would begin to acknowledge and accept our responsibility. Lord, that we would be moved to a heart that acknowledges our hand in our own brokenness. Lord, then as we look to start the rebuilding process, we look to start growing, as we look to start committing our life to you. Lord, that we would turn 
to you in that. And we know not by our own work that these things are accomplished. Lord, we love you, we turn to you, we trust you. In your precious name, Jesus' name, amen.